Well, here we are, millennials, McLuhan, and the generation gap. What could these three things possibly have in common? Well, further to how I was just introduced, my job is leadership. I study leaders. My job is to help make them better. I create and design mentoring systems that create ethical leaders. My job is to know when leaders are having a problem. And guess what? Leaders are having a problem with millennials. And you know what? Millennials are having a problem with leaders. That begins to get us the classic generation gap. So what, who are these millennials? Let's just start with millennials. Well, millennials were born between 1982 and 2000. They're sometimes called Generation Y. They grew up with baby on board stickers, um, Bill Clinton, Hurricane Katrina, 9-11, and war. They're sometimes called the screw you generation because let's look at what happened when they were coming of age during the new millennial. Let me see now, let's think back past 10 years. Oh yeah, presidents, prime ministers, countless business executives, and maybe a few sports heroes all lied and very few were punished. Let's think of something else now. Hmm, oh yeah, these kids are the first to grow up in North America in multi-step parent families. The ideas that we produce from television shows like Leave it to Beaver or, you know, Father Knows Best, in my case, Mummy, but are foreign to these kids. That's not what they know. They know schedules. Monday with Dad, Tuesdays with Mom, every other weekend with so-and-so. That's how they lived. They lived by rules and schedules, and that was the norm for them. But what makes them ever so much interesting and what makes them different from any other generation is since grade five, nine years old, these people have been using the internet or social media to connect with each other. So whenever they had a problem with, say, 9-11 or Hurricane Katrina or any one of those things, they didn't just talk to one group of people or one best friend, they talked to groups of best friends because they had the information highway. Or, as Marshall McLuhan would like to call it, don't you know, I just did a really nice segue there. Yeah. He called it the global village. And he did that in the early 1960s, even before we had the internet. Now, Marshall McLuhan, if you don't know, is best known for the medium is the message theory. And Mr. McLuhan also introduced a couple of really important terms that we need to know to understand the generation gap. He introduced the terms extension and amputation. And an extension is something that creates a wider knowledge for man, that makes man a better person. And an amputation occurs because of an extension. It's something that doesn't exist anymore. So if we look at social media as an extension, hmm, that kind of fits the mold, doesn't it? An extension, something that increases our knowledge, increases our connectivity. An amputation is something that we've lost. And what have we lost? Well, traditional lecture-style education. I think we've heard a couple of our professors talk about that this morning. No longer can we just stand there and talk to people. Traditional politics, we've heard a lot about that today. You can't just tell people something and expect them to believe it, because now they can double check. And what also happens is McLuhan talked about the idea of for every great extension, there's a lot of divisiveness. And he gave some amazing examples the American Revolution, and the French Revolution. They used, uh, during that time, the divisiveness was caused by that wonderful extension, print. Print enabled people to have conversations that leaders didn't want them to have. Huh. Now let's look at something a little closer to McLuhan's time, Vietnam. Vietnam and television enabled people to have conversations that leaders didn't want them to have. 
Let's even look today in Toronto and the Occupy movement and around the world, the Occupy movement. We're having conversations that leaders didn't want us to have. When I was in politics, the idea of key messages were really big. Guess what? You can't do that anymore. Because what McLuhan said is, the more extensions you have, the easier it is to be caught in a lie. I don't think we need to tell certain people how easy it is to be caught in a lie now, especially with social media. But what's even more important about all of these things is that what we're beginning to see with this extension social media and what I believe we're going to see with the Occupy movement is they're going to be just like the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Vietnam protesters, who, by the way, in the very beginning were also mocked beaten and jailed. Does that sound like anybody we know and what's going on right now? Yeah, it does. And that whole let them eat cake thing, does that remind anybody else of what's going on on Wall Street? Just a question. What it's doing is it's causing a tipping point and moving us from what is now our cultural instability to somewhere else because of this extension. Now, thinking of instability, let's move on to slow dancing. This year, I made an amazing discovery. I was teaching my students um, construct and internal validity. I know, scintillating topics, and you're all thrilled you want me to talk about them. But for some reason, my students were not on the edge of their seats. They were bored. It's true, I know. So what I decided to do was shock them. And I thought, how am I going to show them that research is, impar is it really important to understand in their everyday life? So I decided to teach them how to use the seven research steps to pick up a man. <laughs> yeah, that got their attention, too. And they all kind of looked at me, and I said, well, let's just start in the very beginning. Because, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, my whole class is women, and everybody's over 21. So I said, now, what do you do before you go out to a bar? Well, I don't know. Do you maybe think about the kind of guy you want to meet? Well, there was a general consensus on that. Mm -hmm. And what do you do when you get to a bar? And they said, well, you know, we sort of pick someone out. I said, that's great. And so then do you get his name? And they said, yes. And I said, oh, so you have a research problem. Well, yeah. And I said, what do you do once you get their name? And they said, well, they pulled out this clever little device and they had a smartphone and they looked him up on Facebook, or they did tweeting, and all. Oh, so we have a literature review. OK, good. <laughs> now they're beginning to get the gist of it. And I said, now we need a methodology to begin to collect data, ladies. What are we going to do? Quantitative? Look up on his Facebook and see how many pictures he has with other women? Mm -hmm. Or perhaps you have your wingman, and they were surprised that I even knew what a wingman was. Thank you very much. Go and talk to this fellow and get some ideas and maybe get her perceptions of him and do qualitative biographical research. Oh, now we're moving. Now everything's swinging along. And I said, OK, let's bring it home. Let's analyze the data and reach some conclusions. We're going to the slow dance, people. Yeah. And that's pretty much where the conversation ended. Because the ladies looked at me and they said, Mayor, Let's be clear, we don't slow dance, we sex text. <laughs> huh? Okay, for those of you who don't know and don't know about Tiger Woods, it's, <laughs> I'll tell you, it's, sexu it's texting sexually explicit messages, mobile phone to mobile phone. Huh, is exactly what I said. So pretty much, I said, that's why your generation is so screwed up. You miss the analyzing the data stage and move directly to conclusions, because then they explain the rest of sex texting to me. And that is exactly where all three things start to interconnect. Because you see, that's what the leaders of the past 30 years have been doing. They, too, have had the breadth and depth of information that the social highway has given us. Oh, yeah. But they've skipped the analyzing the data phase and started look, worrying about quarterly reports and quarterly returns and quarterly this and quarterly that. No one's looked at the big picture. Hell, I'm not even going to get into politics and how short a scale that is. Once you're elected, man, you start re 
going for re-election the next day. How can you think of the greater good? How can you analyze the data and reach some conclusions? So, as a good researcher, I thought, I need to know more about this. So I talked to 34 millennials and 54 professors. Remember, there's that generation gap. And I wanted to know what leadership techniques could we use to begin to bridge this gap, to begin to stabilize what is becoming an intensely unstable community. And do you know what I found out? I went back to my McLuhan. And McLuhan said, you know what? You need a filter. And that filter helps people understand the new extensions, help people understand the new technology. And that filter, I came to discover, was leadership based in mentoring principles. Mentoring principles? What are you talking about? Well, for the past 30 years, our leadership has been based on this whole laissez-faire notion. Whatever needs to be done, do it. Let's just think for a minute where that's gotten us and what have we really accomplished in the past 30 years. Not so much. And let's look at mentoring and the idea of mentoring and the idea of multidimensional conversations that mentoring brings around. And when you mentor, you think of others. You don't think of yourself. It gives you time to analyze the data. So when you're mentoring, you provide the context, you define success, and then you provide opportunities for learn and bring people back and let them understand what they've done. And we found three things or three amputations that mentoring could help. The first one is the death of the best friend and the rise of the group of best friends. Millennials don't just have best friends. They have groups of best friends. And those best friends are what are really important to them, not authority. Because remember, they're the screw you generation and they know authority will screw them. So when you're talking to them, you need to provide everything in context, not just for themselves, but for their whole group of people. In the same way, I kind of made a silly little remark about research and picking up men. The second one is the whole idea of the death of gray and the rise of black and white. These kids have been brought up on algorithms. They've been brought up on schedules. Rules are what makes sense to them. If you're a professor or if you have millennials in your business, the only thing you need to know about that is be really clear. Fill in your syllabuses with the rules of what uncivil behavior and civil behavior is. Don't assume people know this. They don't. Remember, they haven't analyzed the data yet. And the last amputation we found that we really needed to begin to look at and how mentoring can help us put things together was the idea of verbal learning. Let's think about verbal learning for a second. We don't do it anymore. Remember, this is how they communicate, tactile. And from what I understand about sexting, it's all about the tactile with the fingers in the beginning anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> I know, but they taught me. Remember that people don't learn the exact same way anymore. It's our job to help them analyze this data. It's our job to provide the context for them, to create success for them, provide opportunities for learn, and then go back and show them what they've learned. Help them learn to analyze, mentor people. So, as we get to the end, we begin to understand what millennials, McLuhan, and slow dancing all have in common. They're all about change. And the one thing I do know about McLuhan is that he liked change. After all, he was a great researcher, but he sure did look good in an Annie Hall movie. Thank you. Oh.